Hear the latest reporting and analysis on the big stories of the day on the Daybreak Insider podcast. It's top-notch reporting from SRN News, along with the sharpest insight from Hugh Hewitt, Mike Gallagher, Dennis Prager, Sebastian Gorka, and the voices of townhall.com. The Daybreak Insider podcast. It's your first look at today's top stories. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, and at salempodcastnetwork.com. Tired of dealing with vein disease? Have your symptoms gotten worse? These spider veins are ugly. My legs and ankles are always swollen. My legs are tired of standing all day. While some symptoms can be managed by lifestyle changes, other factors are out of your control. Get help from the experts at Vein Clinics of Hawaii. To learn more about your treatment options, call 427-5565 or visit veinclinicsofhawaii.com. Aloha, Hawaii. It's time for the Vein Clinics of Hawaii radio show. Their team's approach to diagnosing problems and developing solutions and treatment plans are beyond compare. So let's get started with your host of the show, Mike Buck, and medical director, Dr. Randall Julith of the Vein Clinics of Hawaii. Okay, so sometimes we have a top ten list, and sometimes we have a, uh, a you know, a bucket list, and sometimes we have other things. And uh, welcome to this show. Uh, we try to give you as varied a look at uh, vein disease as we can. And as you know, a lot of things that we talk about on the show are are fun. Uh, and a lot of them are pretty serious, and, and hopefully you, you learn some each time. I know I do. And I'm not only the facilitator of the show for Dr. Julep, but I'm also a patient at Vein Clinics. And a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today are, are things that got me interested in this thing. So uh, it would be impossible to do it. I know it would be we, – we, we really need the top 5,000 things to know about vein disease. But today we're going to work on just eight of them. So I think we can handle eight at a time. Sounds pretty good. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, and, and I do know that it, the first line in, in the materials you sent me are varicose veins are just the tip of the iceberg. Isn't that interesting? Because what starts out as something that you see on your, your leg or your face or your arm or your, usually your leg, is it, you just, you're, you're curious about it. And it could be the sign of something that you are, in pretty good in, in trouble or that you're pretty good so uh, i i think we're going to see a, a little bit of both sides of it today yeah yeah, yeah i like to uh i like to talk about this kind of stuff in, in a general sort of fashion because um you know a, a lot of people well most people just don't know mm-hmm. and uh, you know it's not their fault but then that's why we do this radio mm-hmm. show to you know hopefully educate uh, because, uh, you know, there are a lot of, there's some misconception and then there are, is a lot of just lack of knowing that, uh, gee, I have this problem or I'm experiencing this symptom. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, yeah. people don't really know that it's due to, you know, vein issues and, uh, you know, vein disease these days can be very easily taken care of. Uh, in a very minimally invasive fashion, and uh, we can uh, make people feel a lot better. Yeah, that's, a, by the way, a huge big curve. And and one of the things Doc talks about often, so I get a, I get a couple of questions even though we have a list today, um, is that I do know that they're hereditary, but I want to go back and say, okay, if they're hereditary, I get it. I was doomed because my mom had them, but why did she have them? Mm-hmm. Well, because your grandma. Well, why did? In other words, let's get to the first case of this. Who <laughs> yeah. is who is uh, patient zero in this? Uh, yeah, we need to get to yeah. that guy. Yeah. Gosh darn it! Oh uh, yeah, but it is just. I mean, I mean, first of cosmetically, it's one thing, but it is just once you start getting these symptoms and things, it's something you you have to you. Even though it takes a long time, which I'm sure you're going to cover, mm-hmm. it it really does need some attention once you recognize some symptoms. Yeah. Well, uh, right. I mean, and uh, yeah, once people start to develop these things that are obvious, yeah. you know, on the surface of their leg and have symptoms or sometimes just symptoms alone. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it it is a significant medical problem and uh, it, yeah, it needs to be uh, evaluated and treated for sure. 
So, you know, one of the you know, first question where you mentioned the first uh, you know comment, varicose veins are just the tip of the iceberg. And, um, you know, I get this misconception all the time mm. uh, because people, you know, people come in often because they have, you know, achiness and heaviness. But the thing that they see on their leg is yeah. varicose veins. Right. Um, so they they kind of immediately you know, since that's what they see, they're immediately thinking, okay, well, I've got this achiness and cramping yeah. or and whatever because of the varicose vein, yeah. and, and and sometimes yeah. sometimes yeah. the varicose vein can be a source of symptoms, mm. uh, but uh, you know again, it's just sort of the tip of the iceberg. Mm-hmm. You know, the uh, varicose veins are really uh, just another sign or symptom of this thing that we call venous insufficiency. And that is the underlying, you know, problem mm. that, is, that results then into symptoms yeah. and yeah. surface. So, you know, so what is venous insufficiency? Well, venous insufficiency just means that the veins in our legs aren't working the way they should. Uh, veins mm-hmm. are the blood vessels that carry blood back to the heart. So veins in our legs should be carrying blood uh, consistently upward on its way back to the heart. And when some veins fail, and, and you know, typically it's not all of the veins in our legs that fail. It's just, a, you know, a, a small number typically. Um, but uh, when those when those veins fail, uh, the blood actually starts to go in the wrong direction. It starts to go downward rather mm-hmm. than up. Uh, and that is then what leads to the mm-hmm. symptoms. Now, why is the, why does the blood auto, you know at some point decide that it's going to go in the wrong direction? Well, what happens is that there is a failure of one way valves. We yeah. have a whole bunch of you know tiny little one way valves in uh, the veins uh, throughout much of our yeah. body, but they're the most important uh, in our legs because we spend most of our li- life in an upright position, and yeah. uh, you know the what we call hydrostatic pressure. Um, is the greatest, uh, you know, the lower yeah. you go down. And uh, so uh, the lower you are in the leg, the uh, more, the even more important uh, are those mm-hmm. valves. Uh, so, and what happens is that those valves fail. And, and by, by the way, gang, I love this part of it because I liken it because I'm a fisherman. <laughs> if you listen to our fish show, I look at it as the salmon going upstream. <laughs> Every time the yeah. salmon can get and leap over that next level, uh, it, 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 it's free to c- continue on its way to get up to the top of the river and spawn. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and if it can't, it's because they haven't got the energy to jump up there. In other words, it's failing yeah. something, you know, their ability. And isn't it interesting, once they get up there and have their babies, they die. You know? but, <laughs> yeah. but, but, you know, I get it. And maybe that's what some a lot of the symptoms come from, the fact that you've got swelling and, and things going on because mm-hmm. you, you're you're just accumulating all of this fluid in the in your legs right yeah. yeah and that's actually that's a great analogy for sure uh you know um it, as those valves fail it makes it you know much yeah. more imp- much harder uh certainly for the blood to get upstream yeah. to where it needs to get to so um so what are the other things that can be caused by venous insufficiency and again you know, I think most people in their mind, they, they connect varicose veins with uh, with a vein problem. Yeah, you know, yeah, they don't yeah. know exactly what's going on, but they say, hey, I've got varicose veins. That's why I came in and my legs hurt and they're swelling mm-hmm. and whatever. Um, but uh, sometimes varicose veins aren't a part of the picture. But, mm-hmm. you know, this thing, yeah. that, this thing that we call venous insufficiency, that valve failure, can cause other symptoms and other problems. So what are they? Well, probably the three most common symptoms uh, are achiness, heaviness, and fatigue. You know, those are the most, um, you know, universally present in most of the people that we uh, are evaluating for uh, venous insufficiency. Uh, they are also the symptoms that are most likely treated well uh, when we treat people for their uh, venous disease. You know, achiness, heaviness, and fatigue are those three symptoms that really are well treated mm-hmm, from the mm-hmm. procedures that we do. Um, so uh, you may not have a varicose vein on your anywhere on your leg, but if yeah. you have that achiness, heaviness, and fatigue, uh, you know, very likely you may have you know venous insufficiency. A couple of other problems or symptoms that we commonly see that, again, many, many people don't know that there's a connection are, you know, muscle cramping and restless leg syndrome. 
you know, now muscle cramping is, uh, you know, again, it's a Charlie horse. It ha- yeah. Often it happens, uh, you know, in bed at night or early in the morning. You know, people stretch and, you know, the, the muscle cramps. Well, uh, you know, that in muscle cramping in the middle of the night, especially in the older age groups, I mean, I hear this all the time in the elderly, you know, they, it seems like muscle cramping seems to be a very common uh, symptom of venous insufficiency in the older age groups. And, uh, and, and you know, it, it, I feel so bad for those people yeah. because the older they are, the, the harder it is, the, yeah. the more difficult it is for them to contend with, you know, muscle yeah. cramping in the middle of the night. Yeah. Uh, you know, what do you do? How do you get rid yeah. of it? You know, you, you end up, uh, you know, having to walk around and it may take a long time and it's interrupting your sleep and, you know, it really impacts quality of life. Yeah, and, you know, it's unfortunate but that a lot of people people wait so long you know to get diagnosed and get treated that's why we do this show because you will you are no matter who you are listening uh you are experiencing some of this already it may or may not be venous insufficiency but you have a lot of these symptoms that that's what happened as we as we climb up the age chart uh, some of these things starts bothering us but i think it's so neat the way you explain this because you, some of the things that you've talked about, you wouldn't associate with a vein problem. Right. You know, and and until you can, you you don't really understand what's going on with you. Yeah. 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 Well, in, in, until you learn about it uh, and, uh, you know, typically uh, people aren't going to be learning about venous disease, uh, you know, just on their own. So that's why yeah. we talk about yeah. it on the radio. But um, so, you know, cramping is a very common uh, problem uh, that people don't necessarily connect with venous disease. Restless leg syndrome is also, number one, most people don't know, they've heard of it, but they don't really know what it is. Uh, But as you know, restless leg uh, syndrome is sort of a spectrum. Uh, You know, restless leg syndrome can be, can can be something as simple as, you know, you're kind of uh, unconsciously, you know, moving your legs and and feet uh, when you're in a sitting position. Uh, and uh, because the uh, you're you're contracting muscles, mm-hmm. and when you're contracting muscles, that helps uh, the <clears throat> blood flow up, and uh, so it's a, it's a way of kind of unconsciously relieving symptoms. Yeah. Or in, in people, I think. Uh, you know, the people sort of connect restless leg syndrome with sleep. And I think, uh, you know, people often they go when they first go to bed, they have a hard time getting their legs comfortable. Yeah. So they're moving their legs around. Same thing. They're contracting the muscles and that that helps uh, you know, the blood flow through veins and, and it helps uh, relieve symptoms. So restless leg syndrome is another one of those things. Swelling is also um, a very common problem that's associated with uh, uh, venous insufficiency. Swelling Swelling is important because it uh, it puts the it puts the patient in the next level in the mm-hmm. next clinical stratus for the severity of, of venous disease. You know, we talk about our you know yeah. clinical there our yeah. SEEP classification and C one through six. Uh, swelling is C three, so we've we've moved from you know C two, which is varicose yeah. veins, in into C three. Which, which again, kind of uh, implies, uh, or in more than implies, it mm. indicates a little higher degree of venous insufficiency. You know, I'm glad you said that because I think that that's one of the things that prompted me uh, to get more to get treatment. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you, you just think, why am I, you know, being swollen like this? Doesn't make any sense. I, I'm, you know, I, I haven't been bitten by anything. It's nothing red. It's just swollen. What's the deal? And right. it, and it hurts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, and unfortunately, there there are more things than just venous disease that uh, can lead to swelling. But, you know, venous disease is probably the most, you know, un- common single thing that will lead to swelling of the lower extremities in most people. Um, then there are neurologic kind of symptoms, numbness, tingling, burning. Uh, you know, we hear people talk about that all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the people will talk about a rash, uh, and it's a eczema type rash that people will get on the lower leg, uh, you know, in the calf. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, it can be very that, misleading, can it? That, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. People, again, I mean, they kind of relate that to a skin problem, sure. so they go see their dermatologist. But, you know, that, and that's something that we call venous eczema because it looks like eczema uh, can be very itchy and stuff. So and itching is another one of those, you know, symptoms. And by the way, people ply on that stuff for months, sometimes before they figure it out. Yeah. And, 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 and everybody does that. I mean, oh, it's a look at my skin. I'll go get some cream. Mm-hmm. You know, right, and, right. and and you get into the routine rubbing the cream so much that you know all you're doing is masking the fact that you got a big problem. Right. Yeah. yeah. And you're not uh, you're not getting rid of the uh, the root yeah. the root cause. You know. So uh, and then there's something that we call skin changes, mm-hmm. and you know as the venous insufficiency worsens and as it you know continues uh, over the course of uh, people's lives, uh, they start to get this you know these skin changes problems with the skin uh and this happens to about 20 percent of mm-hmm. all people with venous insufficiency well, will lot. progress yeah. to you know these types of uh, advanced problems mm-hmm. and what do we mean what do we mean by that well the first thing that starts to happen is that there's a you know a brownish discoloration or a hyperpigmentation mm-hmm. of the skin again of the lower part of the calf and it can work its way up uh, you know, a lot of people associate the, you know, that brownish discoloration of the legs with diabetes or, you know, other things just being out in the sun a lot or whatever. But often it's due to uh, a problem with vein function. So in we Yeah, see and I've learned, learned with patients that I've talked to of yours and friends of mine is that's in the very beginning. What everybody says, well, you know, it's just I'm sunburned or, I, or you know, it's, it, it, this can't be this, this can't be that. And so you, you need to go sometimes by the time somebody finally sees a vein specialist, veinclinicsofhawaii.com, by the way, uh, that it's been uh, a long time that – they could have been relieved a lot a lot sooner had mm-hmm. they had they recognized what some of these signs. Sure, are, you know. yeah, and maybe not have gotten into those yeah. higher you into know, the next levels. category. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, so the skin becomes brown, and then it becomes thickened and fibrotic, uh, and uh, ultimately it uh, loses its, its ability to heal. Uh, so, you know, typically people will, you will have these, you know, skin problems and then injure themselves in some minor sort of fashion, mm-hmm. you know, hit the coffee table or, you know, drop yeah. something on their leg and, uh, the skin breaks and then it won't heal. Uh, and then it turns into something that we refer to as a, uh, an ulcer or a chronic ulcer. And basically that just means, uh, that, uh, you know, there's a disruption of the skin, uh, and, uh, it's not healing the way it should. And, you know, what I usually tell people is that, um, you know, normal wound healing means that you hurt yourself in one way or another, and, uh, you may go through kind of a, an acute phase of, you know, redness and mm-hmm. tenderness and, you know, over several days. But then after that, then you should start to see uh, a gradual improvement in a you know in characteristics of that wound or that injury healing well if that if you don't see that if you see a wound that is lasting for four to six weeks and it doesn't really look yeah. like it's moving in the right direction even that seems, seems like so long yeah but, you know it's it's amazing gang and i've actually experienced this in doc's office talking to other patients some people, and I thought I was I, that I waited a long time. It was about a month. Yeah. But some people, <laughs> they just they just keep waiting and waiting. And you know, I, I'm not trying to be humorous about it, but I mean, I, honestly, uh, they they after they get it finally treated, they feel so relieved because mm. they really they just didn't know that they've gone through you know five boxes of bandages and t- ten tubes of this and ten tubes of that and it's getting worse yeah yeah and, and that's just it they just don't know yeah. that uh, there's a remedy you yeah. know and it has to do with their vein function <laughs> etc yeah. so um so yeah it can lead to chronic ulceration yeah, i mean you know um, actually even a month uh you know many of the patients that we see that come in with you know, venous, uh, st- what we call venous stasis ulcers, they can be struggling with those for mm-hmm. months, you know, very, very, uh, very commonly months. So, uh, but yeah, it's it's a very grateful set of mm-hmm. patients. I and that's say. why I, I love treating uh, some of those people because you get them healed and they're very, very happy, obviously. So, and then, like I said before, 
you know, some people may have no outward signs of venous disease at all. They may not have a vein on their leg. They may, you know, their legs may look perfectly normal. Uh, but you can have underlying venous insufficiency that is actually causing, you know, substantial symptoms. Now, does that happen, you know, in the in the majority of people? No, it's, you know, infrequent. But it's, you know, it's a possibility. Uh, interesting to me on that is that, you know, I think even more credit be given to a patient that doesn't have some wide open, you know, completely identifiable, uh, you know, you know symptoms mm-hmm. but when they find their way to a specialist mm-hmm. they they have really saved in in down the road they've saved a lot of time yeah you know? they've saved yeah. themselves probably a fair amount of misery yeah. for sure yeah. yeah um okay so that that was number one of v8 thing yeah, yeah, so yeah. what is the second one well uh the second one has to do with the people who are the most likely candidates of uh, developing this thing mm-hmm. that we call venous insufficiency. Um, and, uh, you know, the question here is uh, risk factors. You know, we always talk yeah. about risks, risk factors of, uh, you know, this disease process or that disease process. And um, so for venous disease, uh, again, as we've talked about on a number of occasion, occasions, genetics is first yeah. and foremost. Number one. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, typically we inherit uh, the propensity to develop a venous insufficiency. And, and actually, mm-hmm. you know, we were talking about valves, the one-way valves before, mm-hmm. and that's what it is. We're, we're inheriting yeah. the propensity for those valves to fail. Uh, you know, the vein dilates, the vein, the, the valve fails, and then we, you know, we go down the path of uh, venous insufficiency or venous reflux. So, you know, that's the thing that we inherit. And if uh, if you have one parent, that has had a history of venous disease, your chances of of you having venous disease is about 60%. So it's, you know, a, fair, a little bit greater than, you know, 50-50. Uh, Uh-oh. Uh-oh, I feel yeah. a bad number coming on here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you yeah. have both parents, then it's, uh, you know, upwards of 90, 90%. Yeah. So, you know, if, if both of your parents have had venous problems, then, you know, it's almost a foregone conclusion that you will probably have some problem mm-hmm. with the you know, vein function at some point along the way. Uh, now, it, 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 does that mean that everybody that comes into the office, do they can they identify, you know, a parent or a family member um, that has ve- venous disease? Well, no. No. Uh, you know, we, we have a, a good number of people that say, gee, no, my parents uh, were fine as far as I know, and I can't think of anybody. But, you know, the genetics are such that it can, you know, skip a, a generation or whatever. Uh, but uh, typically it's going to be in there. Um, somewhere. Yeah. It's probably a very, very minimal number of people who just kind of have, you know, mm-hmm. what we would call sporadic uh, venous insufficiency due, due exclusively to, you know, their uh, their lifestyle or life uh, occurrences uh, or life events, et cetera. Okay. So. Now, the next one I see, and I this is going to be my question, but it's already here. It's age. Right. And, and you know, because you said many, many times, and gang, if you go to veinclinicsofhawaii.com, you can find out a lot more about what we're talking about. But one of the things that's amazing is, is the older we get, the more likely we are to have things go wrong with us. But the fact of the matter is, in this disease, it, it actually starts before you know it, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and, and right. most of the time, you have it for decades sometimes yeah. before you even know you've got it. Exactly. Very. That's very cruel of it to do that. <laughs> yeah, <know? laughs> very inconsiderate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, age is a risk, but age, I, I always look at age as a risk is being just being the fact that you know, you're you're further down the timeline. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, if you have the genetics, if you have the other other risk factors that, you know, the longer the the longer your life goes on, the more likely it is that you're going to develop it. So, well, you know, in, in one respect, I mean, everybody knows that as you get age, your eyes start to get a little weak and, you, you know, your hair starts coming out. Then you got, you know, your, your teeth are all jammed up. It makes sense that stuff you can't see is also suffering the, the same thing. Age. <laughs> Sure. You know, yeah. yeah. Age, age is a cruel yeah. thing. So, uh, okay. So another risk factor is female gender. Now, uh, you know, the, I think typically we talk about the fact that uh, venous disease happens more frequently in women. And, and that's one of the one of the misconceptions is that 
venous disease happens primarily in women, it does not. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, if you look at a large group of people, statistically, you know, women have a little more higher, a little higher incidence. And that has to do with uh, the the hormonal changes that they go through over the course of their life. Uh, It has to do with the fact that they have, uh, they go through pregnancies, and we'll talk about pregnancy Mm -hmm. in, in just a minute. But uh, you know, so, um, uh, you know, fe- women do get uh, venous uh, yeah. disease a little more frequently. But I got to tell you, we see a lot of men in hey, our I'm office. I'm telling you, when I'm in your office, I it, believe it, I don't think it's quite 50-50, but it's pretty close. It's got to yeah, be close. Yeah, yeah. I, I really, need to, <laughs> I really yeah. need to look at that yeah. sometime. Because, uh, you know, uh, day in and day out when we're treating people, uh, you know, we it just it just seems like we have nearly as many men as women. Uh, and uh, and sometimes they have they they're the ones that have much more severe type yeah, of disease. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, the the people the patients that I've seen you know over the course of uh, you know my career, uh, the the folks that have had the worst, especially varicose veins, mm-hmm. uh, are young are males. Not only are they males, but they're young males. Wow. You know, like yeah. uh, mid mid to uh, later twenties or early thirties. Uh, you know, so, um, so yeah, it's an equal opportunity, yeah. uh, disease process. But, but I, I also think that maybe it may be slightly more balanced because, and, and not, you know, men are, and women are really a lot more similar than we think, but I think that the women are probably a little bit more conscious of it visually, Yeah, you know, and, and particularly in places like Hawaii, you know, where we're outdoors a lot and we're wearing shorts and bathing suits. And sometimes uh, men, if they they can't see them, it doesn't bother them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times these things that you're seeing are on the back of your legs. Yeah, (laughs) right, right. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, women are more concerned with the aesthetics. Women tend to seek medical care for everything Mm -hmm. a little sooner than men. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, gosh, we, we see a lot of men and I think it's probably, you know, as, as time is going on, you know, for a long time again, I think most people's conception was that, you know, vein, vein issues were cosmetic yeah. and women were the ones that, you know, uh, were treated for it. But, uh, you know, as, as time goes on, uh, you know, uh, I think men are becoming much more likely, you know, to come in and, you know, be evaluated. So, and hopefully us talking about it helps. Um, people who have had a DVT, uh, you know, a, d- a deep venous thrombosis or a deep vein blood clot, those people are uh, have a higher risk of ha- developing uh, venous insufficiency at some point in the future. Um, obesity, you know, we 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 see a lot of people uh, who are overweight, and uh, you know, so obesity plays into. Uh, the breakdown uh, or the failure of of vein function, uh, part of that has to do with the fact that uh, there's a a greater intra-abdominal pressure. Mm -hmm. And when there is a greater intra-abdominal pressure and also uh, pelvic pressure, which is where those big, you know, big pelvic yeah. veins are, are draining, or the the leg veins are draining into the very large pelvic veins that go up through the pelvis and abdomen. Uh, and when there's more pressure on mm. those, uh, it's just creating more uh, work for the veins to uh, overcome that pressure and for the blood to go in the right direction. So that's part of it. Uh, and then also the fact that, uh, especially in our obese patients. They have something that we call lymphedema, which is mm-hmm. a little, you know something a little different, but it's very very intimately uh, connected with venous disease. Uh, you know, lymphedema and venous insufficiency go so hand in yeah. hand that uh, you know that's something that kind of uh, and, and lymphedema and venous insufficiency kind of go hand in hand with yeah. obesity. So that's a that's a yeah. And very by, strong the, by, by the way, a price you need to pay. Sometimes is at the end if you are obese and and then later on or not yeah. because of whatever bariatric surgery losing weight uh, some of the things that you got when you were obese don't go away yeah you know I mean you're you're a you're a thin person with lymphedema you know yeah which is usually something that goes more towards somebody who's bigger yeah yeah very, very, sometimes it can be very cruel 
Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, you are absolutely yeah. right. Absolutely right. So, um, okay, so pregnancy is a risk factor, mm-hmm. multiple pregnancies. And, uh, you know, I think each time a woman goes through a pregnancy, uh, there's more wear and tear on her veins. And, uh, you know, we've, we've yeah. talked about, we've, we, we spent a whole show talking yeah. about, uh, you know, pregnancy as it relates to venous insufficiency. But the thing there is that uh, also during pregnancy, obviously, yeah. as the uterus is getting larger, there's a gr- in- increased pressure in the lower abdomen and pelvis that is impeding, you know, vein flow through those very large pelvic veins. Uh, and uh, that is going to, uh, again, put uh, undue yeah. pressure on uh, the venous system and will lead to some amount of failure. Uh, during pregnancy, there is an increase in blood volume. And yeah, I was going to ask about you about that. that. The volume of yeah. blood, more, more blood. Yeah. So, you know, everything's got to work harder. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, blood volume increases by about 50%. So wow. that's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, by, by the way, we should give women a standing ovation for yeah. going through what they go through. Because <laughs> oh, yeah. you, you and I would not do no, this. I, no, I, I would, I'm glad that men can't give birth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and then the also hormonal changes that happen. You know, there's the tremendous hormonal fluctuations that occurred during pregnancy uh, and immediately thereafter, et cetera. So, um, uh, you know, the hormonal changes actually what happens there is that it mm. makes uh, not only veins, but also a lot of different types of tissue sure. in the body more lax. Uh, and, uh, you know, veins uh, fall under that category. So they tend to dilate and become, you know, functioning abnormally. And then the last, well, last couple risks are careers. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, people uh, people who are on their on feet, your feet a yeah, lot. Yeah. And, you know, we see a tremendous number of people like that uh, uh, in a place like Hawaii uh, because of the, you know, numerous yeah. restaurants and bars and, uh, resorts yeah. and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, people, uh, a whole bunch of people work on their feet. And, and, they, cho- and- they, they choose it. They got great careers. I mean, I sure. even know, you know you, we've talked about this before. You have a lot of patients that are doctors, dentists, and yeah. others that really, oh, yeah. they really stand up eight hours a day. Yeah, you know? yeah, dentists, yeah. Uh, you know, many doctors. Yeah. I mean, for many years I was... In the operating you, room, you were and you were that guy. I was, yeah. <laughs> I was one of those people. Yeah. I guess I yeah. still am, yeah. quite frankly. But um, so career matters, and then height. Uh, actually, taller people have a more uh, a higher risk of developing venous insufficiency. So if you can, you know, try not to be too tall. Yeah, don't grow anymore. Stop. <laughs> but it, it is interesting because it. I think particularly a lot of height. I mean, I, I know a lot of guys in there, in, you know, that I played, you know, when I was playing football, the guys are 6'4", six, 6'5", six, some of these guys are big guys. Yeah. And all of them end up with back issues and usually vein issues. Mm, it's right. Just, maybe there's just so much, much of it. Who Very knows? common. Yeah. Okay. So, um, number three, we're up to number three. Um, and that has to do with, are there ways to prevent venous insufficiency? And unfortunately, the, uh, you know, the short answer there is no, there really isn't a way that we can actually prevent it. Are there ways that we can potentially or hopefully alter the course? Uh, Well, yeah, there is. And, you know, our good, our old friend compression stockings uh, are uh, right on the top of the list there. So number one, you know, and is even compression stockings, is that going to completely prevent? No, Uh, but it could it could probably lessen. You know, mm-hmm. the extent of uh, venous disease that any one person may develop, it will certainly postpone, mm-hmm. I think, uh, it getting to a, um, a a significant level. And, you know, where where would this be? Where would yeah. this come in? What, where would this, you know, uh, information come in handy? And I think for those people who... Uh, who they have venous disease and and they're trying to uh, maybe uh, give information or um, you know recommendations to their children you know um, I think that uh, if for those young people uh, probably especially young women uh, if they have two parents who have venous disease then maybe even before they start to have symptoms yeah. or findings, their varicose veins, et cetera, it would probably be a good idea for them to incorporate compression stockings into their daily routine in one way or another. Yeah, I, I guarantee you, because I feel this, I feel that if you have this compression, what you're doing is you're helping these weak valves of yours because if the compression is such that it it can almost power 
by the weak valve. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, enough squeezing, that yeah. blood wants to go up, mm-hmm. you know, and so that's uh, maybe a big part of it. It is, yeah. And this this next one is one that's always interested me because you want to argue it, but then you're you're telling me it's it's not really arguable, and mm-hmm. that's diet and exercise. Yeah. You know? Yeah, uh, well, di- diet diet will have an effect in uh, along the along the way of you know if somebody's obese mm-hmm. and if they diet to the point where they're not no longer obese, that will decrease your risk. Yeah, you know, yeah. but diet in and of itself, if you uh, if you alter your diet, is that in some way going to yeah? There's improve? no vein, no vein food, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. More carrots, okay, no. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and, and exercise also, uh, I mean, uh, you know, is physical activity good? Yes. Um, is muscular activity good for vein function right at that moment when you are exercising? Yes. Uh, but if you are, have the genetic predisposition and if you have other, you know, aspects of your lifestyle that may be, um, conducive to, to, to developing venous insufficiency, then probably Probably an exercise program is not going to uh, be demonstrably, uh, uh, better or make a huge difference. But but it'll make you feel good. So go ahead and keep doing it. Well, but you can do, there's a lot of other reasons why you should exercise (laughs) for sure. I'm not saying you shouldn't exercise. So, uh, okay, so what about medication? Well, there are a number of uh, naturopathic uh, type medications that some people feel uh, do affect symptoms. And there have been, you know, uh, uh, studies uh, yeah. along the line of, you know, looking at some of these things and uh, seeing the symptoms that they may or may not help. There's a few things. Horse chestnut extract. Now, um, you know, and I hear people people ask me about I bet that. You all, I bet they ask you all the time. I saw a little thing on TV the other night about that. Yeah, yeah. right, that that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Or they heard about it from another physician. And, and a horse chestnut extract is probably the most common thing that I get asked about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, do, do I do, do they, they ask me, do I think that they should take it? Uh, and uh, and I uh, usually my answer is well yeah if you take it and if it has a positive effect on your symptoms then yeah there's nothing wrong with it for sure uh, and there's a there's a couple of other medications along the same sort of uh, or in the same sort of fashion uh, that uh, some people might prescribe for the symptoms of venous insufficiency and some of them have again statistically when we look at this in a controlled study some of them have had a um, a significant effect on symptoms uh, what are the symptoms well pain and heaviness are the two symptoms mm-hmm. that seem to be used utilized in some of the studies and we see some improvement you know is it a great deal does it take it away no it doesn't no, but it no. may help a little bit swelling is another one that uh, you know if uh, on some of these medications we may see a little improvement in swelling but are taking those medications is it going to cure somebody of their venous insufficiency no it's not it may help the symptoms a little bit do you think that's down the road i mean obviously we've talked about this before there are a lot of people in a lot of parts of the world that are working on all kinds of things look sure. what just happened with the with the quick development of the vaccine for the pandemic uh but i would imagine that down the road there will be some ways to do some sort of treatment or, mm-hmm. or at least stopping it. But it doesn't look like there's anything right off the shelf that is an automatic, uh, this is going to take care of Yeah, not you. that yeah. we have yeah. right now. Yeah. And and I wouldn't, you know, I, I'm i not, well, yeah, not that we have right now. And I would I would say that probably it's going to be unlikely in my life. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, the these medications are no better and probably not as good as, for instance, just using compression stockings. Mm-hmm. Um, so compression stockings are much better at, you know, relieving symptoms. Um, and also probably there is a, uh, like you alluded to before, uh, there is a mechanical component to compression stockings that yeah. are uh, benefiting, yeah. you know, blood flow that I'm sure you don't see with these medications. You know, the thing with venous insufficiency is that it's a mechanical problem okay. uh, it has to do with uh, you know valve those one-way valve uh, are, valves are failing 
Uh, and uh, so consequently, uh, typically it's going to need a mechanical remedy, uh, not just yeah. a uh, chemical one. And we talk about that a lot, gang, when we start talking about treatment. And if you want to know more about that in advance, go to veinclinicsofhawaii.com and check it out, veinclinicsofhawaii.com. We want, to, we want you to refer that. We don't bother with phone numbers. Too hard to remember, but you can remember veinclinicsofhawaii.com. Right. Um, so, uh, okay, next topic. Um, are there other health issues that can arise because of venous insufficiency? And uh, the answer to that is a definite yes, for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, most notably deep venous thrombosis. And, you know, we've been talking about that, oh, wow. and um, which is always good to talk about. Uh, but people with uh, with venous insufficiency have a five-fold increased risk of de- developing a DVT over the course of their lifetime, as opposed to those people who do not have venous insufficiency. Okay. So, you know, five-fold increase is substantial. A bunch, yeah. And uh, so, uh, so and that, that's one of the reasons why we treat venous insufficiency. I mean, you know, when I'm talking to patients uh, and they ask, uh, they ask me, gee, doc, you know, do I need to have this done? And, of course, the answer is, well, no, you don't need to do anything except pay taxes. And, yeah. you know, uh, but... Um, Reluctantly, as you might, <laughs> but you do have to do that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, the, uh, you know, the answer to that is no. But one of the reasons that we do treat this is to not only treat the symptoms, but also treat the risk of DVT. We're, we're eliminating that, that additional risk of DVT. Uh, DVT in and of itself can lead to poor vein function. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, when people develop a, a deep venous uh, thrombosis, you know, the deep veins rely on these one-way valves also, and the, uh, the valves get disrupted from the uh, DVT, and it can lead to, you know, further problems with reflux and, uh, you know, further uh, overall venous functional problems. So we want to try to avoid that. Um, there's something called uh, post-thrombotic syndrome, and we talked about this a few weeks ago. Uh, and that was a, a patient that we had seen no. in, in the not too distant past uh, that had a DVT. He actually didn't, you know, recognize that he had a DVT, uh, but he had developed this thing that we call post-thrombotic syndrome, and uh, basically, it just uh, it, it, it's the same thing as kind of advanced venous insufficiency. All of those skin changes that we t- typically talk about, the discoloration and the thickening of the skin and the ulceration, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, so that can be a byproduct of venous insufficiency in those people that develop DVT. Um, in those people who develop DVT, they can also have this thing that we call pulmonary embolism. And pulmonary embolism is scary. A, yeah, a blood yeah. clot, you know, a piece of that blood clot breaking loose and traveling up through the venous system and going through the heart and into the lungs. And, uh, and, and people die suddenly from that kind of thing. So, uh, as a matter of fact, 10% of people with a pulmonary embolism have a fatal outcome. Uh, so, uh, so it's, uh, it's an important thing uh, that, that, uh, again, another reason mm-hmm. why, uh, we should be concerned about venous insufficiency because it can ultimately lead to these things. Yeah, and gang, we've done uh, pr- programs on that as well. And once again, Dr. Julep is, of course, the medical director of vein clinics. And you can find this all on the website. And one thing we, we can tell you, there's no silly questions. Everybody that has some sort of a symptom, uh, you, you go online and get the phone number and call up, make an appointment, get seen and get uh, get counseled uh, and find out, uh, you know, where you are on this thing. Uh, VeinClinicsofHawaii.com. So chronic venous insufficiency can also lead to superficial venous thrombosis. You know, there's deep venous thrombosis, Mm -hmm. and then there's superficial. And superficial venous thrombosis typically is a sudden clotting off of uh, superficial varicose veins. I mean, typically that's how we see it happen. Um, And uh, and we talked about this also recently, is in light of the fact that you know superficial venous thrombosis is something that we sort of blew off before. We kind of minimized it, but it really is nowhere near as as Benign as we once thought, uh, but uh, you know, ac- acute episodes of SVT can 
uh, take, can be, you know, very symptomatic yeah. and can interfere with uh, lifestyle for a while. It can take a while to resolve. Um, SVT will lead to DVT, so superficial clot can lead to a deep clot, which is even more lethal. Uh, about twenty five percent of the time. Yeah, so there, that's a major warning signal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, about five percent of superficial blood clots are associated with pulmonary embolism. So, uh, again, uh, these uh, these uh, superficial blood clots are uh, can be damaging and even you know fatal in a very very few. Uh, but uh, again, nowhere near as benign as we uh, thought they were. Uh, as the prog- as the process progresses, uh, again we can develop uh, skin problems that we've talked about uh, that lead to chronic ulceration. And uh, you know, chronic ulceration is is something that you know the, this country spends you know billions of dollars on every year yep. uh, for the treatment and you know the uh, lo- loss of work and uh, it's, uh, hospitalizations and surgical procedures and all that sort yeah. of stuff. Yikes. So, yeah, and the, and the list goes on there, gang. So that's that's when you yeah. when you look at these different stages of uh, of uh, embolism. I mean, not embolism of uh, venous insufficiency. Uh, this cash register starts ringing. So the more you do, and the earlier, the the better you can either, you know, deflect that or 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 defray it completely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So n- next item number five. Uh, what what are some of the things that can be done for venous insufficiency? And this is these are the things that we do every day, all day I'll long. We treat, yep. And um, so one of the one of the basic procedures that we do is something called endovenous ablation. Um, and uh, and what, what what does that mean? Well, endovenous ablation basically means that we close a vein down. So if uh, if a vein is not functioning properly, then we close it down. Why do we close it down? Well, or you know, why don't we repair it? Well, mm-hmm. unfortunately, we don't have the technology at this moment to uh, repair what would no. need to be repaired. Uh, to fix, you know, for instance, a saphenous vein, you know, we talk about these uh, one-way valves, yep. and um, the these valves are just t- very, very tiny little yep. wisps of tissue, uh, you know, when you look at them, in, you know, in real life, and uh, when they fail, it's, uh, it would be, it, it's, well, again, it's just not technically yep. possible at this moment to surgically repair those tiny little valves in the superficial vein. Um, so rather than doing that, we close the vein yep. down. And the, the good news is you can, it makes new ones and, and no amount of treatment is going to get you to a point where you don't have enough veins anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah. And basically what's happening is that when we close a vein down, we're forcing the blood that would otherwise have been going through that vein. Got to go somewhere else. Yeah, to be rerouted to normal vein. Mm-hmm. And when it gets rerouted, then it comes back up to the heart the way that it should. Uh, so, and the reason that that works is because we have many, many and plenty of veins, uh, alternate veins in mm-hmm. our legs that will easily take over the work of the ones that we're closing. And yeah. we get, I, I get that question all the time. Number one, I guess. Yeah. yeah it's like, uh, gee, doc, isn't that going to hurt me if we close the vein down? And, and, and I say, well, no, it's the opposite. Actually, it's going to help <laughs> yeah, you. Help um, you know. and then the next question is, well, gee, isn't that going to overpower then the veins that you're rerouting the blood to? And, uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, you know, the veins that yeah. are there that are over, that are taking over the work of uh, the ones we're closing easily take over, you know, the flow and it does not affect their function at all. So, um, so what are the things that we do? Well, there are um, thermal ways uh, that we close veins mm-hmm. and that, that basically that has to do with laser uh, a laser fiber that we put in the vein or a radio, what's called a radio frequency device. Uh, both of those uh, heat up the inside of the vein and cause the vein to close. So we're, we're closing the vein. We're basically cauterizing the vein yeah, from the inside. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when we Amazing, cauter- by the way, uh, the equipment. If you had surgery years ago, your mom or your grandma, it's a whole different thing now. You, you walk in, you walk out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in, in, we use the, the thermal devices to ablate veins in some areas of the body in some settings. And then there are a number of non-thermal devices, 
uh, or processes mm-hmm. that we can use to close veins also. Uh, and uh, in different situations, mm-hmm. we use either one or the other, whichever is the most optimal. Uh, but, uh, you know, how do we do that in a non-thermal fashion? Well, there's uh, chemicals and there's... Uh, actually a biologic glue that we're using these days uh, to close veins and then uh, a couple of other devices that uh, kind of use a combination of uh, di- different things. But um, So we, ju- we just use, we use whatever device is uh, the most optimal for that patient in, 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 that, uh, in that situation. Interesting to me, gang, and I've learned this over the years, that, that not, a lot of the stuff we're talking about has been developed within the last 30 years or so. So, I mean, there's been such... Tremendous improvement in the treatment of, of this con- this disease based on the need to do things a little bit differently, and it certainly is working. Uh, I, I would imagine, Doc, that a lot of the people that we talk about on the show that were previous, you know, vein surgeons, they would say, "Wow, I can't believe you guys got all that stuff now." Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's it's really nice. It, which is, you know, when we've talked about this before, one of the reasons why I decided to kind of, uh, you know. Uh, special further specialize uh, you know within the vascular realm to just venous diseases because yeah. there's so much new stuff going yeah. on and it's really been exciting uh, to see it uh, you know kind of un- unroll in the last 20 years or so and this is why gang if you take a look at this and, and I hope you can see this list one of these days is that th- there, there are so many arrows in the quiver now it's a matter of diagnosing yeah. and treating and deciding what's happening and uh, and you could use I mean that's the gift that you have that you decide what that specific patient needs for what specific thing, and it may not be the same thing over and over again. It might be something totally different each time you visit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we do we do endovenous ablation. Another thing that we do is something called microphlebectomy, uh, and microphlebectomy has to do with getting rid of varicose veins specifically, and uh, we do this very minimally invasively also. Uh, which, by the way, everything that we do is minimally invasive. We don't we don't make big in, we don't make big incisions anymore. Uh, everything we do is just through little needle puncture sites. But you know, for to get rid of varicose veins, we you know numb the area up real good that we're, we'll be working on with a local anesthetic, uh, with a numbing medication, and then we uh, make just little tiny needle puncture sites uh, that we go through the skin. And uh, we have special instruments then that we go through those puncture sites and are able to uh, extract the uh, varicose veins. And uh, it does a a very, very nice job. And those little needle puncture sites are um, are, uh, heal nicely and, you know, cosmetically it gives a, a very, very good result. Um, now some, in some settings, um, people are not doing, you know, uh, microphlebectomy Mm. and, you know, I, I have found that, you know, getting rid of the varicose veins as opposed to just treating the underlying Mm. reflux Mm. and hoping that the varicose veins go away are that, uh, number one, it gives you a much better cosmetic result. Of course. Uh, but also you're eliminating the possibility of, you know, those varicose veins being a problem with, Mm superficial venous thrombosis and all this other stuff. So uh, in my mind, it's important mm-hmm. to uh, get rid of the, the varicose veins. And then we do sclerotherapy uh, in a variety of different ways. Um, yeah, that's what I've had. I love that because it's it has a start in the middle and an end. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. So uh, what is the treatment experience? Well, you know, people come in and uh we uh we have a fairly routine way of uh you know evaluating them uh, we do a history and a physical uh we uh you know find out about their family history find out if they've had any other you know further or any other treatment for venous disease in the past uh we do a physical examination we look at their legs pretty uh, extensively and figure out what uh, the signs are there and uh and we put them on the uh you know the clinical spectrum we uh, mm-hmm. you know come up with you know uh, at what point they're at um which is uh, a good thing to do with respect to uh not only f- you know trying to figure out the uh the extent of urgency that there might be in treating them uh but also it puts them on a uh you know a a timeline you know it kind of puts them not only a clinical classification but it gives us an idea about you know at what point in the whole you know scope yeah. of you know the uh, process are they 
Uh, and then uh, we do an ultrasound, uh, you know, in most people. Uh, that gives us a pre, you know, just doing the ultrasound gives us a very very complete look at you know what the status is of their uh, you know venous disease, and um, then we kind of go from there. We we also make a decision as to whether something further might need to be done diagnostically. You know if mm-hmm. if we are concerned about the venous system higher up, you know we've talked about pelvic veins and abdominal veins and sometimes they are a question sometimes they are part of the of the pathology sometimes they're a big part of the problem and there are ways to do that usually we use ct scanning or mri uh but uh you know whatever uh, we need we uh do to evaluate them fully and then sometimes we have to look at their arterial side too uh but uh you know with our diagnostic modalities these days uh, we have a very, very complete way of uh, showing uh, us exactly what's going on, and that acts as our roadmap to figure out what needs to be done. I'm telling you, we're going by leaps and bounds. And by the way, that's another very important part of it, Doc, and you explain, you sit down and uh, and talk about the insurance and, 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 and yeah. what is what is and what isn't covered. And more and more of it, thank goodness, some of these insurance companies are understanding how important it is to deal with this. Right, yeah. Yeah, by and large, uh, Medicare and uh, pretty much all of the major insurers cover all this stuff. The only thing they don't cover are things that they that are would be considered completely cosmetic and um, that basically for us, that's really just spider veins. Yeah, little um, tiny little every, things. Yeah. Everything else is, you know, medically important uh, along the lines of venous insufficiency. So uh, the insurance companies are going to cover that. So, so all you got to do to get in the queue, and it won't be a long when you get an appointment, you get in there. Uh, it's, it's time well spent. Uh, it's uh, it's on four islands, but right now we're talking about uh, here in Honolulu. But you can go online and see Vein Clinics of Hawaii. That's veinclinicsofhawaii.com and learn a little bit about a little bit more about this and you know we hope to see you again next time in the meantime once again it's veinclinicsofhawaii.com we'll see you around the bend well that's our program for today and we certainly hope you enjoyed meeting us please come back next week for our next episode and in the meanwhile to learn more please visit our interactive website veinclinicsofhawaii.com that's veinclinicsofhawaii.com